morning, everybody. And welcome to this joint Society for Thoracic Imaging and International Thymic Malignancy um, Imaging Awareness Group. This, my name is Christina Fuss, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this program. We have four distinct speakers, and I don't want to waste your time. Um, and we will kick off the first talk right away. The first talk is going to be on PET of the thymus, and it will be given by Dr. Chad Strange. Mm -hmm. Dr. Strange is an associate professor of radiology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Let uh, Help me welcome Dr. Strange, please. And so my hope is everyone can see that now. Yes. All right, great. So I'm Chad Strange. I'm from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center down in Houston, Texas. Certainly would like to thank um, STR NITMEG for inviting me to speak today on PET-CT of the thymus. And I've got no disclosures. So um, the objectives today are really pretty simple for this. We're going to discuss some limitations of PET-CT when imaging the thymus. We're then going to try to define exactly what are the roles of PET-CT when imaging the thymus. And then we'll briefly conclude at the end looking at a fewer new PET agents um, used in thymic imaging. So there are a variety of um, physiologic and pathologic lesions found in the prevascular mediastinum. There's benign and malignant germ cell tumors, benign and malignant thymic lesions, as well as lymphomas. And our focus today will be on imaging malignant thymic tumors. And additionally, there are a variety of imaging modalities used to evaluate these lesions. Now, radiographs may be the first to suggest a prevascular mass, but obviously contrast-enhanced CT or MRI can both be utilized to diagnose stage and follow thymic lesions, and these modalities will be covered in, in separate lectures. So our focus for the next few minutes is going to be looking at PET-CT imaging of the thymus. Now, it's important to understand at the outset that PET-CT, frankly, has several limitations um, related to thymic imaging. Um, the first is that PET-CT can have a number of false positive results, meaning that there's FDG uptake that suggests that there's malignancy, but there's really not. And so one of the common false positive scenarios um, is in the setting of infection. So this is actually a lung cancer patient um, that developed an MRSA mediastinal abscess. And so you see marked by the errors, there's these areas of kind of mass-like hypermetabolism, but this is just related to, to infection. There's, there's no you know, malignancy present. A second source of false positive results um, can be with inflammatory processes. A common one is fibrosing mediastinitis. So this is, you know, a fused PET image. There's this focal nodular area of hypermetabolism. It certainly could be concerning for a tumor. But when we look at the CT images, there's, you note that there's some ill-defined soft tissue that surrounds the SVC. That's marked with a straight arrow in the middle image. And there's also um, ill-defined soft tissue surrounding the right pulmonary artery noted with a straight arrow in the lower image. There's also calcified mediastinal lymph nodes marked with curved arrows in the, the middle and the lower images. So when you take these findings together, this is consistent with fibrosing mediastinitis. And so the focal nodular prevascular FDG uptake is really a false positive finding related to an inflammatory process. It's not malignancy. And so these PET findings in infection and inflammation, they just remind us that everything that takes up FDG is not malignancy. Another potential source of false positive PET in thymic um, imaging is thymic hyperplasia. So there's two different kinds. There's true thymic hyperplasia or rebound hyperplasia, and that's present when the thymic volume is increased by more than 50%. And it's commonly seen after infection, surgery, burns, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, steroid therapy, things like that. The second is lymphoid or follicular hyperplasia, and that's present when there's increase in the number of lymphoid follicles. It's commonly associated with autoimmune diseases, uh, myasthenia gravis, HIV, things like that. So in this case, in the upper images, note that there's prevascular soft tissue masses. It's noted with the asterisk there. Um, it's mildly hypermetabolic on the fused PET image. The lower images were obtained, this is a lung cancer patient, the lower images were obtained before the administration of chemotherapy, and note that there's really, there's no FDG uptake, there's no masses noted in the prevascular space. So this is simply true or rebound thymic um, hyperplasia after the administration of chemotherapy. So this is a false positive PET-CT, and, and clearly this could be mistaken for a thymic malignancy. <clears throat> 
the final false positive scenario, it's, it's technically not a false positive. There really is tumor there, but this is worth remembering um, when reading PET-CT for, for thymic tumors. PET-CT can't differentiate thymic malignancies from any other hypermetabolic prevascular tumor. So many aggressive hypermetabolic prevascular masses frankly look pretty similar. So this um, prevascular mass is a mixed germ cell tumor. And, and really PET-CT wise, there's really not any way to tell that apart from a thymic tumor. Um, similarly, this is a large hypermetabolic prevascular lymphoma, really cannot be definitively differentiated from a thymic malignancy. I mean, I think there's suggestion that it's lymphoma because the vascular structures are engulfed and not invaded. But it reminds us that the bottom line is, is when we're imaging the thymus, there are several false positive scenarios that, that you just have to be aware of. Conversely, PET-CT can have false negative results as well. So this is when the PET-CT is negative, but there actually is malignancy present. Now, there are several technical factors that can cause false negative results that apply to all PET-CTs, and, and those are really beyond the scope of this talk. But specifically with thymic tumors, some of the low-grade tumors just aren't FDG-AVID. Um, this is a biopsy-proven B2 thymoma. There's essentially no FDG uptake, and, and this just reminds us why tissue diagnosis is so important. So when we take these findings together, we got to be very, very careful using PET-CT in thymic imaging because there's several false positive and false negative scenarios um, that, that we have to be aware of. So in light of these limitations, I want to turn our attention to defining what exactly is the role of PET-CT then um, when imaging the thymus. And so as you might have guessed already, it's incompletely defined. It is frankly sometimes unclear uh, exactly how PET-CT is used with thymic imaging. So the literature, unfortunately, gives a mixed evaluation of thymic PET-CT imaging. Um, over the last several years, a number of studies have indicated that FDG uptake can be used to diagnose thymic malignancies, as well as to differentiate low-grade from high-grade tumors. So some studies have looked solely at the SUV max value. Uh, there are some studies that postulate that there's an SUV max threshold that can you know, definitively tell us between benign and malignant lesions. Other studies have tried to biologically benchmark uh, the FDG uptake with the tumor measurements, such as the SUV max to T index. Um, other studies have looked at normalizing the FDG uptake to background mediastinal uptake, such as the TNM to, um, TNM to ratio. The problem is, is that while you have all these studies that show PET-CT is very helpful, it can differentiate, it can help you decide this, there are other studies that show almost just the opposite, that, that there's a lot of overlap between SUV uptake patterns, between benign and malignant, between low-grade and high-grade tumors. And so because there's this overlap of SUV findings, um, many of these studies you know, often have small sample sizes, it's frankly left a lot of unanswered questions um, as to what is the exact usefulness of PET-CT imaging um, in thymic tumors. So here's what we do know. In general, we know PET-CT is useful imaging tumors that are aggressive and metabolically active. That's true anywhere in the body. Luckily for us, most high-grade thymomas, thymic carcinomas, and thymic neuroendocrine tumors avidly uptake FDG. So in many of the tumors, there is at least some role for PET-CT imaging. So here's an example of a high-grade invasive thymoma. There's mediastinal invasion that's noted by the arrow, pericardial invasion noted by the asterisk. This tumor is clearly hypermetabolic. So in this hypermetabolic tumor, PET-CT is going to have a role. Here's a, um, so we know that like in these metabolically active, um, active tumors, PET-CT is going to have a role in nodal evaluation, looking for areas of local invasion, plural invasion, distant metastasis, things like that, if they're hypermetabolic. So here's an example. There's a right prevascular thymic tumor. It was hypermetabolic. I don't, I don't show that image here, but there's an adjacent N1 lymph node. It's marked with the arrow in that middle image. So this was a hypermetabolic tumor. This node is hypermetabolic. So the PET-CT is now telling us this is a metastatic N1 lymph node. Here's an example. There's a left prevascular high-grade thymoma. It was also hypermetabolic, and it's not shown. Um, in the upper right image, there's a pleural nodule noted with the arrow. So this nodule is markedly hypermetabolic. So this is a pleural metastasis. So PET-CT is clearly helping us in this case. 
Another role for PET-CT in these hypermetabolic tumors is the detection of occult metastasis. So this PET image, there, you know, you can see there are multiple osseous metastasis, but several of these were new. The lesion in the right humerus, the right clavicle, the pelvis, uh, many of these lesions were new. And here's the fused and the, the routine PET that went with that. So these new hypermetabolic metastasis in the right humeral head, the right clavicular head, really have no CT correlate. These would not have been identified on CT image alone. So this just highlights the role of PET-CT in the detection of occult metastasis. So the role of PET-CT in thymic tumor imaging, it's complicated. There are false negatives, there are false positive, the literature is equivocal, but in hypermetabolic tumors, it's quite useful evaluating nodal distant metastasis as well as detecting occult metastasis. So how do we do this in real life? You know, if, if we pull this all together, how do we use PET-CT in real life? Well, there's no clear guidelines when to use PET-CT for tumors that look like they may be, you know, thymic tumors, but here's how many surgeons use this. If they have, if, we, you know, if a patient has a prevascular tumor, it's well circumscribed, it's homogeneous, there's no evidence of local invasion. That is, I mean, it looks like a non-aggressive, you know, early thymoma, like the image here. Most of the time, or at least many times, um, they don't even biopsy these. They'll go straight to surgery. They don't need a PET CT. If the tumor is more aggressive appearing, so the tumor is heterogeneous, there's irregular borders, there's suggestion of local invasion, such as you know the image here. So this is now a more concerning tumor. Surgeons don't want to perform a thymectomy because these patients often require neoadjuvant therapy. Additionally, more aggressive appearing tumors may you know may represent a lymphoma, which of course is not surgically treated. So in this scenario, with a you know a, a tumor that looks more aggressive, surgeons will often use PET CT for a couple of reasons. One it will help guide their biopsy. They'll find, you know, the most hypermetabolic portion of the tumor, and that will guide the, the biopsy prior to resection consideration. And then if the tumor is FDG avid, PET-CT will help detect metastatic disease like we just discussed. And so this helps delineate for the surgeons patients that are not surgical candidates. It helps tailor their treatment, and it helps then avoid unnecessary thymectomies. So while PET-CT may not be part of a routine examination in thymic imaging, it certainly has a role in a case-by-case -case basis. Now, up to this point, we've been discussing, you know, FDG PET-CT, kind of routine PET. But I want to finish by briefly looking at a couple of newer PET agents. One of these newer agents is gallium-68 dotatate. Gallium-68 dotatate is an agent that is more specific for neuroendocrine tumors, or in this case, thymic carcinoid. So it's been shown to better identify metastasis in thymic neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, Hefsabah reported that gallium-68 dotatate better detected orbital, supraclavicular, mediastinal, and hilar metastasis compared with routine FDG PET-CT in, in a patient who had known thymic neuroendocrine tumor. Now, while this is clearly limited to just neuroendocrine tumors, it does, you know, have a role in thymic imaging to help differentiate between some of those tumors. Another newer PET agent is called gallium-68 FOPI. Um, it's a quinolone-based tracer that acts as a fibroblast activation protein inhibitor, hence the name FOPI. Um, gallium-68 FOPI shows promise imaging tumors which overexpress fibroblast. So Yang reported gallium-68 FOPI uptake in a thymic squamous cell carcinoma and was thereby able to differentiate that tumor from a lymphoma, showing that there was at least a potential role for this agent differentiating um, between different thymic tumors. Now, the downside is gallium-68 FOPI uptake has been reported in at least 28 different cancer types. So there is certainly some limited usefulness, but what I think the study highlights is that there is an increasing role of receptor-specific and tumor-specific imaging. So in conclusion, remember that PET-CT has several known limitations when imaging the thymus. These include false positive results, such as infection, um, inflammatory processes like fibrosing mediastinitis, thymic hyperplasia, as well as the um, inability to differentiate between a variety of malignant prevascular masses. There's also false negative results, such as low-grade thymomas that just don't show up on um, PET imaging. Additionally, the literature remains equivocal as to the role of PET-CT in thymic imaging, but 
but there are a few clear roles um, with PET-CT imaging the thymus. It's useful imaging aggressive, high-grade, metabolically active tumors. So in high-grade thymic tumors, it's very helpful in the detection of nodal, distant, and occult metastasis. In more aggressive appearing tumors, surgeons sometimes use PET-CT to guide biopsies and determine which patients are surgical candidates. Finally, there are newer PET agents available and being developed that will continue to fine tune PET imaging of the thymus in the future. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, please feel free to email me if you have any questions or comments. And then I've included just a brief bibliography if you're interested in further reading. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic overview of uh, thymic PET CT, and you know I'm sure we will talk more later. Um, we will move on to the next talk, and the next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Sanjeev Bala. Um, Dr. Bala is a professor of radiology at Malincourt Institute in uh, of Radiology at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, and Dr. Bala will talk to us today about thymic disorder mimics mediastinal masses because it's not always the thymus. Please, Dr. Pala. Good morning. And before I begin, I just want to thank both the organizers from the STR and ITMIG for inviting me to speak and share our experience with you today. Um, I am Sanjeev Bala from the Malincrod Institute of Radiology in St. Louis. I, I should just begin by saying that I have one disclosure that's not relevant to this discussion. Now, something that Dr. Strange had alluded to in his, his talk was the compartments of the mediastinum. And I think many of us know them as the anterior, middle, and posterior compartments of the mediastinum. But uh, through the work of ITMIG and some of the author's uh, affiliations with ITMIG, there's been the proposal of uh, alternative names based on location that may be more uh, reflective of uh, descriptors of the compartments, namely prevascular, visceral, and paravertebral. And we all know that the thymus resides in the anterior prevascular compartment. And just at, by way of starting, it's useful to think of the thymus as being a triangular shaped structure. Uh, and these are just some examples from a normal CT uh, in a patient with pre and post contrast, just to show the normal configuration, the triangle of the thymus in the prevascular or anterior compartment of the mediastinum. Notice that in the same patient, because of the fatty nature of the thymus and because of some streak, oftentimes with post contrast images, the normal thymus is a little bit difficult to appreciate. I do want to share with you, as Chad had alluded to, that thymic hyperplasia will take on this triangular appearance on occasion, and Dr. Ackman will be covering that in her discussion. This is a patient that had a multi, a multiple lymphoepithelial cysts of the thymus, but I show this just to highlight that in a thymic a thymus with some normal variant, you can see this kind of triangular shape on a coronal image that can be very suggestive that you're dealing with a thymic lesion. So. Let's um, talk a little bit about some of the findings that we might see with a prevascular anterior mediastinal lesion. I think for those of you reading uh, conventional radiography, just a good reminder that an anterior mediastinal mass or prevascular mass will have obtuse angles with a mediastinum as compared to a parenchymal mass, which will tend to have these acute angles. And this was a patient with a thymoma that was sitting in the anterior mediastinum. Notice how how low it sits kind of as a cardiophrenic angle mass. And Dr. Raptus will be alluding to some of those features in his discussion. So let's go through some mimics that you may encounter with the anterior mediastinum. And I share these mimics uh, with some general themes that we will be uncovering as we go through the talk. The first is that we all know that when we are confronted with an anterior mediastinal lesion, it's so important to look at the percentage of cystic elements versus soft tissue elements to help us confirm whether something is benign or malignant. Uh, and Gene will be talking about that with MR of anterior cystic lesions. But I do want to remind you that not everything that sits in this anterior mediastinal compartment is actually of the thymus uh, or a thymic cyst in origin. What we've noticed in our practice is that oftentimes the anterior recess of the superior pericardial recess will sometimes be very capacious and can mimic an anterior mediastinal cystic lesion. And this is one such patient where the original interpretation was concerning for possible thymic cyst, but if you look closely, you can see a communication with this anterior recess of the superior pericardial recess, and on the sagittal images, it really shows it quite nicely. So be careful, because sometimes pericardial diseases can simulate thymic processes. 
Here in, on the next slide, I'm gonna show you two different examples. Above the yellow line is a patient who had a pericardial cyst. And you can see that this pericardial cyst on first glance can look like a low-lying anterior mediastinal mass or anterior mediastinal thymic lesion. But again, the pericardial cyst can sometimes simulate that. Now, if you look at the patient that's below the yellow line, you'll see what looks like a complex cystic and solid lesion. On first glance, this might be confused with some sort of cystic thymoma or germ cell tumor, but again, we remember the rule that anterior mediastinal masses can sometimes arise from the pericardium. And in this case, this was an anterior mediastinal uh, extension of a mesothelioma of the pericardium. So this was a primary mesothelioma of the pericardium. Notice the stalactites of soft tissue extending into the epicardial fat. And you'll notice that the loculations from the tumor simulated this cystic anterior mediastinal mass. So pericardial lesions can certainly fool us when we're dealing with anterior mediastinal or previsceral uh, prevascular lesions. Another thing to consider uh, when we're evaluating patients that may have a potential thymoma is to make sure that the patient has not had a median sternotomy. You can see that this patient presented with a very large anterior mediastinal mass sitting in the cardiophrenic angle region. But if you look closely, you can see changes of a coronary bypass grafting. Patient went on to CT and MR, and you can see that this is a large uh, aneurysm of a saphenous vein bypass graft. So when we've got these anterior mediastinal lesions in patients who are post-surgical, we have to remember that there's a potential that we're dealing with a vascular complication from that surgery, such as an aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm. So in the postoperative patient, be really careful in calling a thymoma. As we mentioned, the fluid to soft tissue ratio can be very helpful. Uh, and this is something that Dr. Raptus will allude uh, in his experience with thymomas. But when we're dealing with lesions that are mostly cystic, it's important to consider, are we dealing with possibly a thymic cyst or other cystic lesions of the anterior mediastinum? In this patient with cystic lung disease and a classic appearance for lymphangiomyomatosis, you can see how a lymphangioma of the anterior mediastinum might fool us at first into thinking that we are dealing with a thymic neoplasm. If we look below the box, you can also see that this person has soft tissue a lesion in the anterior mediastinum with multiple small lymph nodes and these islands of, of fluid. This is a pretty classic look for nodular sclerosing Hodgkin lymphoma, which may or may not arise in thymic tissue and can be sometimes confused for thymic neoplasm. So useful to look at the amount of fluid as a soft tissue begins to predominate, it makes us think about malignancy um, and it's useful also to look for other findings within the lungs. Now, something that Chad had alluded to in his discussion on the um, use of PET-CT in anterior mediastinal lesions is to look to see if there's involvement of the chest wall and to also see if vessels such as the internal mammary artery and vein are spared. In this example, you can see that there's this anterior mediastinal lesion. Again, some fluid, but a lot of soft tissue making us worried about potential malignancy. But you'll notice that this extends into the soft tissue and spares the internal mammary artery and vein. This is a pretty classic look for lymphoma. And in this patient with HIV, this was a non-Hodgkin lymphoma arising in the anterior mediastinal lymph nodes, avoiding the thymus. So if you see this anterior chest wall involvement and relative sparing of the adjacent vasculature, think for a moment, is this person potentially have lymphoma? And this may be one of the few instances where percutaneous biopsy may be performed before resection. Another entity that can be a fooler, um, but usually will present with symptoms of chest pain or possibly fever, are, is an infection of the anterior mediastinum or of the chest wall. This was a young patient that had presented with a chest wall um, osteomyelitis chondritis, and there was extension into the anterior mediastinum. We can see that there are these areas of low attenuation and low signal, better delineated on the MR, extension into the anterior chest wall, and there's actually a chest wall deformity that was also associated with this lesion. So when we see that there's chest wall invasion, let's take a moment, look to see if there are any symptoms that might suggest infection, or if there's some vascular findings that might make us think of a lymphoma. Another uh, finding that may have us consider a lymphoma as a potential is intravascular invasion. As Costa will allude to, occasionally this can sometimes happen uh, with some thymic neoplasms, but when we see that there's involvement, as we did in this patient who is pregnant, that should at least get us thinking about, is there a potential for lymphoma? And if you notice that there's extension into the chest wall, 
relative sparing of the internal mammary uh, artery and vein. Uh, and as expected, this ended up being a B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, very typical appearance to get this intravascular invasion. Now, in our practice, we've seen that occasionally vascular processes can tar start to simulate uh, anterior mediastinal masses, and namely thymic neoplasms. This was one such case. A patient was referred to us because a biopsy at an outside hospital had a suggestion of a Hodgkin lymphoma with atypical lymphocytes from a percutaneous biopsy. I think we can all appreciate there's stranding in the mediastinum, there's this kind of soft tissue elements in the prevascular space, but maybe some tiny lymph nodes or thymic tissue. But I think we also all can appreciate that there's a lot of stranding in this anterior mediastinum. Well, we went on to get a PET-CT, and the PET-CT was negative, which is unusual, as Chad had alluded to. And you can see on this post-contrast image, we can again see the soft tissue mass with some stranding. The MR was useful because it showed that this has a pretty kind of homogeneous fat stranding uh, and suggested that the brachycephalic vein uh, was missing on the left. And that's because this left brachycephalic vein had thrombosed, and this was a venous enlargement and venous infarct of the thymus. So when you're confronted with a thymic lesion, take a moment to look to see if there's any potential for uh, involvement of the brachycephalic vein. And if you don't see it and you see a lot of stranding, be alert that it could be related to venous edema or the venous infarct. Another entity that may sometimes simulate thymic neoplasm um, is going to be a patient who presents in the setting of trauma. Uh, in the setting of trauma, occasionally thymic bleeds can result in enlargement of the thymus, uh, and you can see some active extravasation in the thymus. This is another patient in the setting of trauma who had an anterior mediastinal mass, uh, and yet a third, this was from a sternal um, uh, dislocation of the manubrium and body of the sternum. So in the setting of trauma, if you see enlargement of the thymus, certainly you may have a patient with thymic hyperplasia, but occasionally you'll get patients with thymic bleeds that can simulate masses. So be a little bit careful. Now, fat can also be useful as we approach these anterior mediastinal lesions, in addition to looking at the fluid to soft tissue ratio, in addition to looking at the soft tissue involvement of the chest wall with relative sparing of the internal mammary artery and vein, uh, in addition to looking for vascular involvement. It's useful to look for fat. And here are two different patients who presented with chest pain where there's some soft tissue and mostly fat. These are both examples of fat pad necrosis in the setting of a fatty infarction with acute chest pain. So occasionally we'll get patients who present with this pericardial fat pad necrosis that can simulate a thymic neoplasm. So be careful if it's mostly fat. Now, if you see that there's mostly fat and on your coronal reconstructions or sagittal reconstructions, you can see a defect in the thymus. Don't forget about a foramen of Morgagni hernia, which can sometimes simulate an anterior mediastinal mass. And occasionally you may have a malignancy such as this one, where this was a patient who presented with a malignant germ cell tumor. And you can see that there's only some minuscule components of fat, but again, lots of soft tissue in the anterior mediastinum. Now, something that Chad had alluded to, which uh, usually isn't too much of a problem here in the Midwest of the United States is fibrosing mediastinitis. Fibrosing mediastinitis uh, will have uptake on FDG PET. It tends to be in the middle mediastinum, but very, very rarely can be in the anterior mediastinum. It might be suggested because there's some vascular occlusion, there's some odd shapes to the process. You may or may not see calcium associated with the lesion. Uh, all of these can be useful in making the distinction. But at the end of the day, you may end up having to resort to biopsy to make the diagnosis. Uh, as Acosta will, um, he'll offer some insights on calcium in the setting of thymomas, but we can't use calcium alone to confirm that we're dealing with a benign lesion here in the anterior mediastinum. But be, be careful that occasionally fibrosing mediastinitis can be a mimic. So we go now to uh, other lesions that can be mimics. Um, and these tend to be more infiltrated. You'll notice that these lesions are more likely to be in both the anterior uh, mediastinum as well as in this patient in the middle mediastinum and even some extension in the posterior mediastinum. When we see soft tissue, this is pretty unusual for a thymic malignancy to involve all three compartments. It's much more typical for some sort of fibrosing condition, perhaps IgG4 or some sort of uh, fibrosing metastases. The patient above the yellow line, unfortunately, had a metastatic lobular carcinoma with desmoplastic metastases involving the multiple compartments of the mediastinum. 
Below the yellow line, this was a patient who had diffuse acute histoplasmosis, needus tinnitus, and that can sometimes be a fuller as well. And this next patient is a patient who had diffuse lymphangiomas throughout the mediastinum. And lymphangiomas and are pretty notorious for involving multiple compartments of the mediastinum, especially when they're not associated with uh, lymphangiomyomatosis or LAM, because these, these isolated lymphangiomas tend to be like mesenteric cysts, and they tend to be very insinuating and disregard our, our compartments of the mediastinum. So I know we've covered a lot of lesions uh, as we talked about some potential mimics for thymic neoplasms and thymomas. Clearly, when we're dealing with the prevascular or anterior mediastinal compartment, we often have to think about thymic neoplasms, which our next speaker will talk about, lymphomas and germ cell tumors. Perhaps the lymphoma is suggested when, you're deal when you see that chest wall invasion with relative sparing of the internal mammary artery and vein. It's useful to look for fluid um, because the more fluid filled something is, the more likely it is to be benign. Uh, and as we said, pericardial fluid can sometimes be a real mimic for thymic neoplasms. Look for fat. If you've got mostly fat, beware of the fat pad necrosis or morgagni hernia that can be a real fooler. Obviously, we talked about vascular lesions, and especially in the patient who's postoperative. And although calcium may be suggestive of some of these things, they certainly don't get us off the hook related to thymomas. And with that long list of diseases, I'd like to turn the speaker uh, platform back to uh, our moderator, Dr. Foos, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, as uh, usual, Dr. Bala, a fantastic talk on mimickers uh, in the anterior mediastinum or the mediastinum per se. Uh, we shall move on. And again, a quick reminder that please put your questions into the chat. We will address them at the end of this webinar. Uh, our next speaker, um, as has been alluded to, will continue this walk through the uh, thymic imaging world. Um, it's uh, Dr. Konstantin Raptis. Dr. Raptis is a professor in diagnostic radiology, also at the Bellingford Institute of Radiology, and um, he's the director of thoracic MRI. Dr. Raptis will talk to us about who, where, when, and what uh, imaging of thymic malignancies. Please help Hello. me welcome Dr. Raptis. Hello, and uh, everybody can hear me and see my pointer, I hope? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I was originally asked to give this talk, and I'd like to thank uh, Edith and Christina for inviting me. It's, an, it's a nice pleasure to be here today and talk about thymic malignancies. Uh, we do a lot of work here for thymic malignancies, and I've done a lot with them. Most of it actually is based on MR and a lot of the things that Sanjeev talked about, mainly using MR to distinguish between uh, things that we need to treat in the anterior mediastinum, many, many of which are, are thymic, uh, and things that we don't need to treat. So I had this talk, it was going to be who, where, when, what imaging of thymic malignancies. And I had an idea of what I wanted to, to talk about. I was going to talk about the WHO classification, uh, which, is, which is relatively new and has been redone in 2021. I was going to talk about some imaging appearances and and then what you do, what you do when you find a thymic lesion. So I did a bunch of reading. Um, I, I looked up some of the World Health Organization documents, and I, I read the Blue Book. I looked at some ITMIG things. I looked at the new staging. Um, and then I said, well, I have to get some cases to give this talk because it's going to be pretty boring if I just present you with a bunch of papers. So what I actually did was I went and looked in our case file. Uh, we have a, a conference here every week that's been going on since the 90s, and we have over 10,000 uh, cases that are stored up in this Excel file, and, and then we have PowerPoints. And so I spent like the last two weeks looking through that group of 10,000 cases to find all the thymic lesions. And it turns out we had hundreds of thymic lesions, many, many thymic lesions, some of them cancers, some of them uh, benign. And this took me like 20 hours to do it. And then I changed the title of my talk from that to something a little bit more colorful, which is basically I spent the last two weeks with hundreds of thymic tumors. And, and this is what they told me. So, you know, in, in this exercise of looking at this number of thymic neoplasms, I started to notice some patterns, things that maybe I didn't really appreciate before. Um, and I think things that I hope will be of value for you uh, in your clinical practice. So hopefully this is entertaining. Uh, it's going to be very case-based. And our first case is here. This seven-year-old, she's got a cough and she's just getting a radiograph purportedly uh, to look for a pneumonia. Uh, and this was a great call. It's called on the radiograph. You can see that there is some thickening of the anterior junction line. You've got this density sitting right here that kind of overlaps with the trachea 
and the aortic arch. And if you pick that up and you see that obscuration of the anterior junction line, you're immediately going to move to the lateral radiograph and look anteriorly. And you'll see it there as something that's relatively dense and filling the anterior mediastinal clear space. Can we see that? We're strongly concerned about an anterior mediastinal lesion. And because this is probably incidental and it's a 70-year-old, we're well, we could just guess it's likely going to be a thymoma. Of course, this is going to go on to CT. And we can see that the CT shows us a lesion in the anterior mediastinum. It's predominantly cystic, but it has some soft tissue that's somewhat nodular. And this is a great look for a thymoma. Thymomas can have lots of different appearances. They're often just solid masses that have some enhancement, but about 30 to 40% of them have some cystic change. And many of them are nearly completely cystic. And so this went on to surgery, nothing else has to be done. And that turned out to be a thymoma. As I was looking through these cases, I, I started to realize that many of the thymomas that we've encountered at our institution were picked up on exams for totally different reasons, tons of them on radiographs, tons of them on radiographs, preoperative radiographs, a huge source of them, patients coming in for coronary artery bypass grafting. And I'm going to show you a couple of those cases, find a thymoma. Well, here's one that we found on a calcium score. Good news, your calcium score is zero. Bad news, you have a lesion in your anterior mediastinum. It's not that bad of news. It's very well encapsulated and surgically resected type A thymoma. Here's one that was picked up on a 41-year-old woman who was here for high-risk screening for breast cancer. Mass in the anterior mediastinum. Did a CT on it. It has areas of high attenuation, which are likely uh, enhancing. And this goes in a bucket, and it's a type B1 thymoma. So, you know, thing one that I learned, and I sort of knew this, but it was really put into perspective when I was finding or seeing all these thymomas that were picked up on lung screening, calcium score, regular radiographs, is that thymomas are usually incidental in adults. And, and I know there's literature out there that has the percentages of, of thymomas that present with symptoms or perineoplastic, but I think just based on what I saw, it that may be an underestimate of how many of them are incidental because there's likely patients that we never image that have thymomas in their anterior mediastinum. Now going to the opposite end of the spectrum, here's a 10 year old boy with lethar lethargy, 10 years old. And you can see looking along this right heart border, this is a, a tough call, but it's one that's makeable and it was made on the radiograph. There's sort of this double density. You can see the heart border here and then you see this, this border here. And it's you look at that, you might say, well, is there something overlying this right hilum? And you can see it actually has an inferior border right here. That's the classic hilum overlay signs. So we've got something overlying the right hilum, but I can see the vessels through it. Okay, so that means it's probably not in the hilum. It's either going to be anterior or posterior. And I look at this lateral radiograph. Well, there's definitely nothing back here, but there's sort of this increased density anterior. So this was read as a potential anterior mediastinal mass, a 10-year-old boy with lethargy goes on to get a CT and actually you can see that the finding on the radiograph is actually a huge lesion I mean this was very subtle I think on the radiograph but on the CT it's much much larger it's and it's got a mix again fluid soft tissue but here we're in a totally different demographic and clinical presentation the patient is symptomatic they're lethargic and number two this is a younger patient so we had this mixed lesion anterior mediastinum, soft tissue and fluid. And I think people wanted to think it, maybe this is some sort of germ cell tumor, uh, could be one of the more malignant ones like seminomatous or non-seminomatous perhaps, uh, causing a lethargy. And that was thrown out, out there as a possibility. Patient also got an MR. I'm not sure it really needed in this case. We've got all this soft tissue. This is gonna end up being a surgical lesion, but the MR shows it's filled with fluid on our balanced steady state free procession. And, and indeed that big component posteriorly uh, was pretty avidly enhancing. In working up this patient uh, for their lethargy, there's a huge panel of labs drawn. And this patient actually had anti-acetylcholine uh, receptor uh, antibodies, and they were thought to have myasthenia. That then pushes us into a whole new territory. And we're thinking thymoma plus perineoplastic syndrome. This lesion was resected, and it was a type B1 thymoma in a 10-year-old. Okay, So I think one of the things I learned, and we saw a bunch of thymomas, uh, in young patients is that, you know, thymomas can happen at any age. Now they're, they're the most common anterior mediastinal media mass in mediastinal mass in adults, but they can still happen in younger patients, young adults and children amongst a broader differential diagnosis of other lesions, many of which Sanjeev showed you in the previous talk. 
Third thing that's important here is the relationship between thymomas and perineoplastic syndromes. Of course, the most common one is myasthenia. There's some estimates that up to a quarter of myasthenias, myasthenia gravis have thymomas. This is a patient who presented with myasthenia gravis type symptoms, was found to have a B3 thymoma. Patient in the middle, this is a patient who was getting a CT for anemia after COVID. Uh, and they are found to have a big mass in their anterior mediastinum, it's kind of off uh, to the left here. Uh, and this too turned out to be a thymoma, different perineoplastic syndrome. This is pure red cell aplasia. Sometimes uh, the clue is actually of the potential perineoplastic syndrome is on the imaging. Uh, this patient on the right had a history of recurrent infections um, and they were getting a, a chest CT basically to evaluate these infections. Um, and we found this big anterior mediastinal mass but on top of that, lower lungs, a bunch of airspace disease, their extensive mucus plug bronchi, and that appearance should suggest potential hypogammaglobinemia or some sort of con condition that led to underlying recurrent infections. Indeed, there's an association, thymomas and hypogammaglobinemia, that's known as good syndrome. And that's what this patient had. That lesion was resected and was a B1 thymoma. So thing two, thymomas can happen at really any age, even young people and children, and they can be symptomatic and perineoplastic syndromes are a big clue. And when you have that clue, that can really increase your confidence that an otherwise potentially nonspecific anterior mediastinal mass in any age group may be thymoma in origin. All right, next case here, we've got a 69 year old pre-op for cabbage. Again, we're not expecting to find anything here. We've got a big mass, it's centered at the right cardiophrenic angle. It's like one of these classic radiology differential diagnosis regions. And people always like to throw out, well, could it be a Morgagni hernia? It's very anterior. Could it be a fat pad? Could it be a pericardial cyst? Maybe it's lymph nodes. But, you know, we've encountered this many, many times that this spot, the cardiophrenic angle, not that bad for thymoma. This turned out to be a very big solid mass. And I'm going to show you some other thymic lesions that occur at this location. This was resected uh, and turned out to be a thymoma. The reason why thymomas can happen there is because the thymus lives in the prevascular space, and that's bordered superior by the, superiorly by the thoracic inlet, inferiorly by the diaphragm, anterior by the sternum, laterally by the parietal pleura, and posteriorly by the anterior pericardium and great vessels. And it's this fat space up here. When we look at our multiplanar reconstructions, we can realize that the, ant, that the prevascular mediastinum goes down very, very low. So this is part of it. And this is part of it. Great location for, thy, for thymic lesions to incur. So if you see something low, even that cardiophrenic area, don't automatically default to that classic differential diagnosis and keep thymic lesions in mind. And this is a little bit of a different case. 50-year-old with cough, and he has this right paratracheal perhaps or perhaps a lung lesion, hard to tell on the chest radiograph. CT shows a lesion that's actually not in the anterior mediastinum. You can see this is posterior to the, to the brachiocephalic vessel. So this is a middle mediastinal mass. And in this case, we gave a broader differential diagnosis. It included things like uh, metastatic disease, uh, lymphoma, Castleman's, perhaps this is some kind of granuloma uh, related to histoplasmosis infection. This was surgerized, taken out, and it was a type A thymoma. It's important to recognize that about 4% of thymomas are ectopic. About half of those that are ectopic are in the middle and posterior mediastinum. You can also have thymomas in the lung, the thyroid, the pericardium, uh, and the pleural space without an anterior mediastinal mass. Here is one such of those cases. It's a rare, it's a rare one. 39-year-old with a seizure disorder, had this gigantic effusion. It looks super malignant and concerning on chest CT, and we thought this was gonna be some, you know, some sort of metastatic disease, had actually turned out to be a B1 thymoma involving only the pleura. There was no anterior mediastinal mass in this case. And this is often described as a rare lesion known as a pleural predominant thymoma. So thing four is that thymomas can be in weird places. Don't only think about the anterior mediastinum superiorly. All right, next case, 13 year old, again, another child with shoulder pain. Another unusual look, very strange looking lesion, right? It's causing a contour deformity along the left aspect of the mediastinum. This isn't your normal cardiac border. And it's got this speckled high density that looks like calcium. Now this uh, child's sister actually had an osteosarcoma. Um, so at this point, people were wondering, well, maybe this is some weird 
bone tumor that's happened in the anterior mediastinum. We CT'd it. It's got this peripheral calcified rim, lots of soft tissue, but lots of this speckled calcium or bone. Since we were dealing with a young patient, things like germ cell tumor were definitely brought up. Uh, something weird that was of bone origin was brought up. I think thymoma may have been thrown in, but this was removed and turned out to be a thymoma with metaplastic bone. And I didn't really think of calcium and bone as a feature of thymomas. I, I kind of think of them as being more soft tissue masses, but that's actually not that infrequent. And many of the cases that I encountered had calcium and bone, and it was often speckled. So if I see a, a mass in the anterior mediastinum, it's got very dense and confluent calcification. I often think of a either an old infection like histo or perhaps treated lymphoma. But when I get this speckled look, don't forget thymoma. Can happen, can happen with calcium. All right, my next case is a 52-year-old. Here's here for preoperative evaluation of a cabbage. Again, we're not expecting to find anything here. This patient has a mass that's overlying the left hilum. And again, we can see the vessels through it. So great look for the hilum overlay sign. Not sure I see anything posteriorly, but anteriorly as well. Kind of hard to pick it up. I'll tell you, the anterior clear space is a weird is a weird location. Sometimes you can see the mass really, really well, and other times you can't. But we've got a definite finding on the radiograph, and that requires a CT to, to work it up. CT shows big anterior mediastinal mass, somewhat irregular border along its left aspect, and a bunch of small pleural nodules. This was highly concerning for a thymic neoplasm, and we said there's probably spread to the left-sided pleura. Ended up going on for surgical uh, exploration to get tissue and to stage its lesion. This is an old case. It's like 20 years old. And this came back as a thymoma. It's actually from 2000, the sort of A, A, B, uh, B uh, classification that was developed by Rosai in 1999 wasn't in widespread use at that time. This was probably best categorized as some sort of B two to three thymoma. Uh, and the patient ended up getting the primary mass resected and they went on for radiation. Interestingly, this patient uh, lived for 20 years uh, and ended up dying of an unrelated cause. While over that time, this thymic lesion got sort of worse and worse. They were on all sorts of different types of therapy. Uh, this left pleura was biopsied at one point and actually came back as thymic carcinoma, which we're going to talk about in a bit. The link between thymoma and thymic carcinoma is, is somewhat controversial. But the key here is that this is a thymoma that's not confined to the anterior mediastinum. Incidental, but outside that space. It actually involved the lung uh, at surgery and involved the pleura. Okay, so thymomas like to be invasive. Okay, and we sometimes think of them as these benign neoplasms, but they are not benign. Uh, the World Health Organization describes them as all potentially malignant. I think that's kind of a problematic term. They can be locally aggressive. This is a thymoma going to the left pleural space. Here's a thymoma that involved the lung and the left pleural space. Here's a thymoma that's invading the superior vena cava. And here's a thymoma that's got a ton of left-sided pleural disease and was kind of just extending into the lung as well with that irregular border. The bottom line is that if you've got a mass in the anterior mediastinum and you see either local invasion uh, of structures of the mediastinum or invasion of one of the pleural spaces, thymoma should be very, very high on your list. In some cases, we may go from CT to MR to stage the extent of thymomas. It's very good for looking at vascular spread. Uh, this is a patient with a B2 thymoma known by biopsy that was extending into the left brachiocephalic vein and superior vena cava. Very easy to see on balanced steady state free procession imaging. We also do a nice job with T2 and low B value diffusion of showing nodularity of the left pleural space that enhanced. Okay, so this was again another thymoma with spread to the pleura and mediastinal structures. I will caution you that what you're seeing on imaging may not completely correlate with surgical findings. And at least at our institution, we like to get proof of the spread uh, to confirm it. There are some papers that I think make some claims that are a little bit overestimating the power of imaging. This is a patient with a known AB thymoma. It was abutting the pericardium and there was a small pericardial fusion. We thought for sure this was going to be pericardial spread of the thymoma. Uh, the lesion didn't drop out in an opposed phase imaging. Gene's going to talk a bit about that. The effusion enhanced, but actually at surgery, this was just pericarditis completely unrelated. So this was a thymoma confined uh, to the anterior mediastinum, didn't have any spread, even though the imaging was concerning. So thymomas can be locally invasive. They love the pleura, okay? Look for the pleura spread. If you see spread to a, to a distant site or to a local site, make sure you confirm that with some sort of testing, either mediastinoscopy or biopsy.
Next case, 68-year-old woman with chest pain, big mass, big, big mass, anterior mediastinum. You can see the vessels through it. You can see it on the lateral. CT shows a huge mass, areas of some central necrosis or cystic change. And this was biopsied and found to represent a squamous cell cancer. Now, our surgeons actually had a question like, is this a lung lesion or is it mediastinal? And we had a big debate about it. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, it had some acute angles and subplaces, but we, we ultimately favored it to represent an anterior mediastinal lesion in part because it, we felt like it was centered there and also because the thymic vein went into it. And, and this did turn out at surgery to be a thymic carcinoma of squamous cell origin. This presentation for thymic carcinomas, not uncommon. These patients don't present with perineoplastic syndromes. That's extremely rare in thymic carcinomas, but they often present with chest pain. Okay, this is another patient, chest pain, huge mass, again, cardiophrenic angle in this case, CT, big, big mass, areas of necrosis, resected, thymic carcinoma, squamous cell type. I think it's important to pause for a minute and consider the WHO classification of thymic tumors, just so you know what's on the menu. Your thymic epithelial tumors are thymomas and thymic carcinomas. About 75% of thymic tumors are thymoma. These are again regarded as potentially malignant, but I really hate that terminology. They like to be locally invasive. They're staged based on their microscopic appearance with increasing amounts of lymphocytes and dysplastic cells. Thymic carcinomas are frankly malignant, many, many different types. Okay, they all look about the same. And I think even distinguishing thymoma and thymic carcinoma, very, very difficult on imaging. There are also neuroendocrine tumors of the thymus, which are broken up by the same strategy that we do for lung neuroendocrine tumors, typical nake, typical carcinoids, and small and large cell carcinomas. These look a lot like the other tumors. They're often fairly aggressive looking, overlap a lot with thymic carcinoma. It's important to recognize that other tumors of the anterior mediastinum often involve the thymus. We see lots of thymic lymphomas. We can see mets to the thymus. Even your germ cell tumors usually arise from cells of thymic origin, but your WHO classification of thymic tumors really describes these three entities as the thymic specific lesions. In terms of the spectrum of imaging for thymic carcinoma, it can have a wide spectrum. I showed you that classic appearance, the big mass, but sometimes they're smaller. They may have little areas of necrosis. I mean, this one I don't think is, indistinct, is distinguishable from any of the thymomas I showed you. It was also directly invading the lung. We can see this irregular border. They can grow into mediastinal structures. This one was incidentally picked up and very small, and this is just a mass. Okay, so thymic carcinoma, big, big spectrum of imaging, and also can be seen in younger patients. We think of thymic carcinoma as disease of older people, and it's true that it is, but here's a 16 year old with weight loss and fatigue, mass in the uh, overlying the right hilum, big anterior mediastinal mass, very heterogeneous, and this turned out to be a thymic carcinoma in a young patient. So rules, they really are meant to be broken, particularly in rare tumors. So number seven, thymic carcinomas can have a broad imaging appearance and they can affect a broad uh, range of patients. I would like to touch a bit upon the TNM staging for thymic neoplasms, what you do when you find a thymic tumor. We're all probably heard the term, the Masaoka staging system. That's the old staging system. It's since been removed for the TNM stage classification. Just like with lung cancer staging, these older staging systems were based on a small number of cases, in this case, only 96 cases, from a focused area of the world. The new staging system, big collaborative effort, 10,000 cases retrospectively acquired. It was a collaboration between uh, ITMIG, uh, International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. It's a much more robust staging system. Very similar, but there are some key differences. One is there used to be a lot of uh, worry about whether it was extending outside the capsule in the TNM staging. Those are both T1 tumors. Uh, the lung is a big, a big place for it to go. If you get into the lung, your T3, again, pleura, ends up being M1A. The new TNM staging system also gave us specific nodal stations for thymic lesions. You've got your anterior perithymic nodes, which are basically in the anterior mediastinum adjacent lesion. And you've got your deep intrathoracic or cervical nodes, which are basically not in the anterior mediastinum, more middle or posterior. And of course, metastatic disease can be seen in the setting of pleural, that's M1A, or parenchymal M1B disease. Lots of similarities with how this is described with lung cancer staging, but this is the kind of terminology and the things you should be looking for with thymic lesions. When it comes to thymic carcinomas, I think pattern of metastatic spread is helpful. This is 75-year-old with a thymic tumor. The needle biopsy could not differentiate thymoma from carcinoma. Again, mass the mediastinum, lumpy, bumpy pleura, easily could be a thymoma. 
bunch of small pleural nodules, but this one's not pleural, that's parenchymal. And if you've got a parenchymal nodule in the setting of an anterior mediastinal mass, your concern is thymic in origin. That's much more likely to be a thymic carcinoma than is a thymoma. Thymomas rarely go to lung uh, or to solid organs or the bone. Another interesting example shown here, this patient presented with diffuse hepatic metastatic disease, was biopsied and found to be a squamous cell cancer. They biopsied it multiple times. And they were telling us, well, we think it's thymic. We ended up getting anterior mediastinal imaging, and, and you can see that they actually had do have a small anterior mediastinal mass. So weird case, extensive mats. This thing, I mean, you'd think it was something very, very low grade and not that concerning, but ended up being a thymic carcinoma that metastasized predominantly to the liver. So thing eight, TNM has replaced Masa Oka. Thing nine, carcinomas are more likely to have parenchymal solid organ and bone mats. I think that's much more useful for trying to distinguish thymic carcinoma from thymoma. Than, uh, than looking at the actual lesions themselves because there's so much overlap. So in recap, I hope you guys learned something or at least some pearls that you can take for your daily practice. We talked about thymomas usually being incidental in adults, but they can happen, patients of any age. They can be symptomatic and perineoplastic syndromes are a big clue, including myasthenia, pure red cell aplasia, good syndrome. Thymomas can occur in weird places. We talked about the cardiophrenic angle and ectopic thymomas. Thymomas can have calcium and bone. It's often speckled. They can be locally invasive and love the pleura. So if you get anterior mediastinal mass with some pleural disease, think thymic. Thymic carcinomas have a broad imaging appearance that overlaps strongly with thymomas. I think differentiating the prim primary lesions is difficult. TNM staging has replaced masa oka. And lastly, again, carcinomas are more likely to have lung parenchymal solid organ and bone mets. All right, thank you. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to our last speaker, which is Dr. Ackman. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Raptis. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. You know, those cases are, uh, you know, wonderful pearls. And as you said, we'll move on to the last but not least speaker, uh, Dr. Jean Ackman, who is uh, an assistant professor of radiology at um, uh, at um, Harvard Medical School, and she practices at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Ackman will be talking about MRI. Is it your thymus best friend? Hey everyone, and thank you uh, for coming, and thank you to the organizers for having me. So I hope to show you how to use MRI to keep your thymus and that of your patients unless it's advanced tissue characterization favors resection. Here's my disclosure. So the thymus has an important and even critical role in immunity. It subspecializes, trains, and matures T lymphocytes from the bone marrow to recognize self, including the fetus in a pregnant woman, and to fight disease, including infection and, and cancer. Most of this training occurs prior to puberty, with the trained mature T lymphocytes migrating out of the thymus and taking up residence in secondary lymphoid organs. It is pretty much dogma that the thymus is not needed after puberty, but the truth is that we do not know how much value the thymus provides in adulthood. Has it been taken for granted much in the way the spleen was for many decades until the spleen's important immune function in adulthood was recognized? When we think about rebound thymic hyperplasia or that phenomenon, we, we clearly can recognize that the thymus is still very much alive in adults and can rev up again. So what's it doing when it revs up? And I think that's what we don't fully understand. Clearly it gets suppressed by steroids, by chemotherapy. And so if it's rebounding, perhaps it's helping us to reconstitute our immunity. So these are things that need to be looked into further because I think we, we uh, think uh, that thymectomy may not really make a difference to patients, but perhaps it does. And certainly we don't want to resect a thymus unnecessarily for benign disease. We did a study looking at all thymectomies at MGH between 2006 and 2012 and found that 26% of our thymectomies were unnecessary and for benign disease, including thymic cysts or mostly thymic cysts and thymic hyperplasia, which CT uh, caused uh, to be misinterpreted as thymomas uh, and uh, at that time, not much MRI was being performed to help make this distinction. So we ideally don't want to resect thymic cyst, thymic hyperplasia, and, and lymphoma. That wouldn't be very helpful to resect a lymphoma, generally speaking. Uh, one primary exception is that there has been uh, some therapeutic 
benefit demonstrated in resection of even normal thymus in patients with myasthenia gravis. Big New England Journal study demonstrated that uh, efficacy in therapeutics. We uh, showed that MRI had uh, or has a tremendous impact on the clinical decision-making of our thoracic surgeons with a two-year perspective study. MR increased diagnostic certainty and reduced the need for intervention in a significant way. It provided unexpected relevant diagnostic information in two-thirds of cases and changed or modified the diagnosis in nearly half. MRI reduced the need for patient follow-up by 21% and would have reduced it by 34% had we not been following time exists. And it modified the surgical approach in at least half of cases and increased thoracic surgeon comfort with the patient management plan, plan in almost all cases. Let's look at some case studies that demonstrate how uh, MR can be helpful to our patients. This is a 24-year-old woman with a reported who had a reported thymic mass on CT. When we look at this thymic tissue, it still has very normal looking bipyramidal morphology. And if we measure the maximal thymic lobar thickness, which you'll notice done perpendicular to the long axis of each lobe, we, we get the measurement of 15 millimeters, which is toward the upper limits of normal we found in young women and men in the 20 to 30 year old age group. We found a sex difference in normal thymic appearance in adults between 20 and 30 years of age with the thymus of women demonstrating a fuller, more attenuating appearance than that of men and therefore leading to uh, misinterpretation as thymic masses on occasion. So, how do we make a distinction between normal and hyperplastic thymus and thymic tumors? In 2007, Naoka et al. showed cleverly that we can use the same technique we use with the adrenal gland with the thymus to look for microscopic fat in adults and help distinguish these uh, entities because the lymphoma and thymic epithelial tumors should not contain fat whereas normal thymus and thymic hyperplasia usually do contain fat in adults. And that's an important caveat because the thymus atrophies over time becoming microscopically fatty and ultimately macroscopically fatty. But in children, it hasn't atrophied yet. So we do not want to be using chemical shift MR imaging to distinguish normal or hyperplastic thymus from tumors in children. There's another test we can use uh, by MR for that purpose. In 2015, Priola's uh, group uh, in Italy showed that in addition to using the chem shift ratio to uh, detect microscopic fat, we can simply do a signal intensity index provided the in and opposed phase chem shift MR imaging was done with dual echo technique, um, which is widely available on virtually all MR scanners at the present time. The signal intensity index is a much easier calculation. It involves placement of ROIs in just two places rather than four, and I'll be showing you that shortly. So let's go back to this particular case. An MR is requested for this reported thymic mass, which arguably is within normal limits, even on CT for someone in the 20 to 30 year age group. We can see the, the uh, tissue to be T2 hyper intense and to show marked qualitative suppression or drop in signal on the opposed phase T1 weighted image proving the presence of microscopic fat and that this lesion represents normal thymus. Normal thymus because she's a young woman in, in her 20s. If this were a 40 year old, we would be calling this thymic hyperplasia, but it is not tumor and she does not need a thymectomy. Chemical MRI to distinguish normal and hyperplastic thymus from thymic tumors and lymphoma and prevent unnecessary surgery. I just want to show you this, uh, the pre and post contrast images of this case because it's not widely known, but normal thymus and thymic hyperplasia do enhance. Uh, we don't appreciate it on CT because of its lower CT contrast, but on MR, we can very readily appreciate the enhancement of, in this case, normal thymic tissue, which showed some rapid time to peak enhancement with washout over time, which is something that uh, low risk thymomas can do as well. 
But just remember, this is normal, viable vascular tissue. It will enhance and um, is enhancing on CT. We just can't appreciate it. Um, but we'll see it routinely uh, to enhance on MRI. This 22-year-old man with Graves' disease uh, had this mass uh, in the thymic bed on his CT performed for other reasons. And you'll note very full, but still bilobed looking tissue here. But it, we don't know actually whether this tissue is uh, thymic hyperplasia, lymphoma, or even an advanced thymic tumor crossing midline simply by looking at the CT. When we look at the corresponding MR images, we can see that it has a fairly homogeneous T2 uh, hyperintensity relative to muscle. And when we look at the sagittal and in the post-phase imaging, we again see marked qualitative suppression or drop in signal on the opposed phase image, proving the presence of microscopic fat. This is thymic hyperplasia, not tumor. No thymectomy is needed. Uh, when we look at the axial images of the same patient, we can see that there's variable suppression on the opposed phase image of different portions of this uh, excess thymic tissue. And so the question is, is there a thymoma here embedded in this thymic hyperplasia or is it all thymic hyperplasia? So in cases in which we cannot appreciate these, the signal dropout on the opposed phase image with the unassisted eye, we do wanna place ROIs and this is how we do it. We place ROIs on the opposed phase image first, and then we copy paste and we put the a same size ROI, same location on the in phase image, avoiding areas of temp shift artifact um, that could artificially lower um, the ROI value further. When we do this, we can see a signal drop from an ROI, mean ROI of 103 to 88. And remember that MRI our ROI values are not absolute, they're relative numbers. And we calculate the signal intensity index, which is simply a percentage signal dropout calculation. And even in this area, which uh, is brighter in signal on the opposed phase T1 weighted image than the overtly qualitatively suppressing tissue, we can see 14% signal dropout which is greater than the 8.92% uh, suggested in the literature as a way of proving the presence of microscopic fat. Um, I use a number of 10%. So if it's over 10%, uh, there's sufficient signal dropout to call microscopic fat. So all of this tissue is thymic hyperplasia, not tumor, no need for resection. This 22-year-old man had a fever of unknown origin and underwent a PET CT with a diagnost an accompanying diagnostic CT with IV contrast. He has borderline excess thymic tissue for age. So, and, and look at that SUV value of, of 2.9 or uh, essentially three. Um, so is this tumor? Well, as uh, Dr. Strange already mentioned, um, PET can be false positive for benign disease in the thymus, and we really have to be wary because normal thymus, not just thymic hyperplasia, but normal thymus can exhibit uh, hypermetabolic activity. So uh, MR was requested, and when we uh, place ROIs, we can see a percentage signal dropout of 24%. This too is, micro is uh, thymic hyperplasia not tumor, and notice, again, it had an SUV of three, doesn't matter, this is thymic hyperplasia, just hypermetabolic. So remember the hazard of FGD PET imaging in the context of thymic evaluation. This 72-year-old woman had an incidentally found thymic mass on a chest CT evaluating her COVID-19 pneumonia. It's lobulated, it's a soft tissue attenuation, it's probably a thymoma statistically, uh, just if you wanted to just place your bets. Uh, but but diff it, it has a fairly homogeneous attenuation to it. And, uh, you know, could this be a multilocular thymic cyst with some hemorrhagic or proteinaceous material, or is it solid? Well, in this particular case, the MR shows uh, T T1 ISO intensity, no signal dropout on a post-phase imaging, was unlikely to be hyperplasia. It was so mass-like and lobulated, but that's always we always want to keep that in mind. 
But and take a look at the T2 weighted image here. You see the low T2 signal septi coursing through this otherwise T2 hyperintense mass. That is somewhat of a trademark, at least for lower thymomas, to see some organization and some fiber septi uh, coursing through it. Pre and post contrast, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, so rapid type to time to peak enhancement with some washout over time, more characteristic of lower thymomas than higher thymomas, as proffered by Sakai et al. in 2002 and after Radiologica. If we want to actually create a, a time enhancement curve, we can place our OIs first over the most avidly enhancing part of the thymoma or the thymic tissue, and then copying, pasting across the other uh, images at the same level. And when we do this, again, we see the rapid time to peak enhancement. At 20 seconds, it really peaked here, but arguably uh, one minute there's, by standard deviation, there's not much of a difference. So it peaked early with some washout over time. Again, more characteristic of lower risk than high-risk thymomas, lymphoma, and thymic carcinoma as per Sakai et al.'s paper. There's always some overlap. We can't rely on this uh, entirely, but also in the absence of lymphadenopathy elsewhere, this is very much likely to represent a thymoma. And this was a low-risk thymoma. Um, the only confounder was the ADC map showed an extremely low ADC value of 0.9, um, which might put you into the thymic carcinoma ballpark, but the enhancement pattern favored low risk. And indeed, this, this was a low risk thymoma type AB. So a restricting, meaning restricting of the diffusion of water, non-suppressing primary prevascular mediastinal mass on MRI in the absence of lymphadenopathy elsewhere is a thymoma with rare exception. This 38-year-old woman with Graves' disease um, underwent sonography of her thyroid and an astute sonographer noted excess retrosternal tissue and an MR was requested. You'll note that uh, she had 25 millimeter maximal thymic lobar thickness. So at the very least, she has thymic hyperplasia. It note the bipyramidal morphology. So we're really thinking hyperplasia here. Also note the uniformity of signal on MRI, both on the T2-weighted image and on the T1 weighted images. Now, in and out of phase imaging, however, revealed no suppression on the opposed phase image, even with ROI placement, there was no signal dropout. So now what do we do? It looks like thymic hyperplasia, but it's not suppressing. We reported the entity of non-suppressing normal thymus on Ken shift MRI in a young woman back in 2012. And subsequently, the Priola group in Italy uh, reported that we can use diffusion-weighted imaging to help differentiate normal and hyperplastic thymus from lymphoma uh, and, and eliminate some unnecessary biopsies and surgery in this, this manner. So remember that normal thymus and hy thymic hyperplasia should not significantly restrict the diffusion of water, but lymphoma should significantly re restrict it. So let's go back to this case. Here's the ADC map. It lights up like a light bulb, suggesting no significant res uh, restriction of water. In fact, the ADC value was insanely high at four, which is really an ADC value one would find in water. I wouldn't necessarily expect hyperplasia to have such a high value. It is cellular. It should restrict a little bit. Uh, but use an ADC map as an extra tool in these cases where we have non-suppression and you're still suspecting hyperplasia to save patients unnecessary surgery. And if you're still feeling a bit queasy about it, you can always suggest MR surveillance because a lot of times what you'll watch in the cases of non-suppressing hyperplasia is that over time, the hyperplasia will regress and ultimately suppress as it becomes increasingly fatty. This 61-year-old woman had a history of breast cancer and a slowly increasing thymic tissue over three years. And you'll note, even on CT, there's macroscopic fat swirling around islands of soft tissue. So what is this? Is this hyperplasia? Is it tumor? Is it a metastasis? Is it, is it some sort of infiltrative thymic epithelial tumor? Very hard to tell. Is it a thymolipoma? Well, thymolipomas don't grow that fast for one thing, and it doesn't look very organized. It has a sort of an amorphous, swirly appearance to it. Here is the corresponding MRI. 
And lo and behold, uh, there is a lot of suppression on a post-phase imaging. So, so we there's macroscopic fat, but there's also microscopic fat in much of this lesion. Is it hyperplasia? The answer is probably not. Why? Because of the heterogeneity of MR signal here. And, and it's, it's so heterogeneous, not only on the T2-weighted and T1-weighted images, but the pre and post dynamic contrast enhanced images as well. And by five minutes, it avidly enhances in a very heterogeneous manner. So this is some sort of, most likely some sort of tumor given that it's growth pattern over three years. If it were something more acute, we could think about some sort of odd infection uh, with lots of inflammation, but over three years in a breast cancer patient, this is something uh, that's bad. Um, there is no real lymphadenopathy elsewhere. We're not really thinking lymphoma in this particular case. Uh, the enhancement pattern, it would be very strange for it as well. This turned out to be metastatic breast cancer to the thymus. So bottom line is that not every thymic lesion that suppresses or contains fat is benign. So we want to look at the signal morphology and behavior over time of these lesions and correlate clinically before we come uh, provide our differential diagnosis and weight it. This 54-year-old woman had a history of carcinosarcoma of the ovary and a rapidly enlarging prevascular mediastinal mass. By CT, the lesion measured of water attenuation, and it has somewhat of a saccular uh, morphology. So it, could it be an acquired thymic cyst? And the answer is yes, it certainly could in this context be an acquired thymic cyst. Could it be thymic hyperplasia? Sure, it, it could. Um, the water attenuation could be explained by the presence of microscopic fat. Um, microscopic fat on CT tends to measure of water attenuation as opposed to macroscopic fatty attenuation. So that's a possibility, but could it be tumor? The answer is yes as well. An MRI was requested to sort out cystic versus solid. When we look at the T2-weighted image, we see heterogeneous signal. Some fairly marked T2 hyperintensity on the right side of the lesion and some more intermediate to lower T2 signal intensity at the left side of the lesion. Very heterogeneous on T1-weighted imaging as well. And note suppression across most of the image on opposed phase imaging. And also note, Pre and post contrast, the marked heterogeneous enhancement out to five minutes. So, so rapidly growing lesion, someone with a history of an ovarian carcinosarcoma, it's clearly not a benign cyst. It's not hyperplasia, despite the fact that it has fat given this marked heterogeneous enhancement pattern. And this turned out to be a mixoid pleomorphic sarcoma in the thymus. Clearly, it had, it had fat in it. So again, remember, not every thymic lesion that suppresses is benign. We have to look at the whole picture, not just whether a lesion is suppressing or not before we come to a conclusion of benign versus malignant. And I want to highlight how much more information we are getting out of the MR as opposed to the CT. The CT suggests that this lesion may well be benign. This was an incidental finding in the prevascular mediastinum CT. It is of uh, this nodule is slightly hypo uh, attenuating uh, to iso attenuating to the muscle in the chest wall. Is it cystic or solid? We can't tell by CT. It measured 41 Hounsfield units, thymic cysts, and even bronchogenic cysts, or I shouldn't say even, thymic cysts and bronchogenic cysts have been shown to have attenuation values up to 100. Hounsfield units, so we have to be really careful when we're trying to determine whether a lesion is cystic or solid by CT. MRI was requested, the corresponding MRI images, so uh, show T1 iso to hyperintensity, no suppression on opposed phase imaging, homogeneous T2 hyperintensity with a low signal, fibrous or hemocytorin rim on the T2 weighted image. And when we look at the pre and post contrast images, no internal enhancement, just thin, smooth wall enhancement. This is a benign unilocular thymic cyst. Uh, never uh, be dissuaded by the uh, benignant. It, it, you, can, you should not be dissuaded that a lesion is uh, 
benign simply by the fact that it has wall enhancement uh, in this area. If it, there's thin, smooth wall enhancement, a study we did more recently showed that thymic cysts most of the time exhibit thin, smooth wall enhancement on MRI. We cannot detect the wall enhancement on CT because of its lower soft tissue contrast, but expect to see it on the MR. On average, the, uh, the wall thickness tends to be about two millimeters plus or minus one millimeter, it, but it should be smooth and thin without mural nodularity, without subtations to be, uh, for us to be convinced that this is a benign lesion. This was another incidental finding in the prevascular mediastinum on CT. Looks just like the last one, but in this particular case, on MRI, we show the lesion enhances with rapid time to peak enhancement, some washout over time. This was another thymoma AB, not a cyst, this needs to come out. This lesion measured 96 Hounsfield units in the retromanubrial or prevascular mediastinum. It grew, ultimately an MR was ordered to determine whether it was cystic or solid. You'll note that it is cystic, it's T1 hypointense, T2 hyperintense, so no internal enhancement, just thin smooth wall enhancement. Because the wall looked a bit thickened to us, we followed the lesion over time. And, and actually the, the lesion was followed by CT simply because the patient was getting routine oncologic chest CT follow-up for lung cancer. And look what happened. Over time, uh, not, not only the lesion get bigger, but it, it ultimately got smaller uh, to the point that it was barely perceptible in, to, uh, in 2015. So these lesions can uh, increase in size, decrease in size. They can change in attenuation and signal. Um, as uh, we found in our investigation of these cysts, which we followed for many of which we followed for more than five years. So remember that thymic cysts may have CT attenuation values as high as 100 Hounsfield units. They can change in size, CT attenuation, and MR signal over time. Therefore, interval enlargement and other above described changes in and of themselves do not signify malignancy. But remember that development of irregular wall thickening, mural nodularity, excuse the, the typo there, and enhancing septi may indicate malignancy. There's an incidental finding here on the chest radiograph. radiograph. Take a look. Here it is in the prevascular mediastinum on the right. Here it is on CT. The internal characteristics were mostly of water attenuation. It looks like there's a wall here. Is this a thymic cyst? Well, let's take a look. On the MRI, the lesion is centrally T2 hyperintense and a variable T1 intensity. And notice that a, a substantial part of the internal aspect of this lesion suppresses on opposed phase imaging. Pre and post contrast imaging shows little internal enhancement, but for a septation and some mural nodularity anteriorly within the lesion. So basically, what do we have here? We have a cystic thymic lesion, which suppresses on opposed phase imaging. So this should be a dermoid cyst, not a regular thymic cyst. And, and that is what it was at surgery. So thymic lesions can be very tricky, especially on CT. Let's use MRI to sort them out and better guide clinical management and prevent unnecessary thymectomy and, and, when, and when biopsy or surgery is needed, we can use MRI to often guide the patient and patient management. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ackman. That was uh, also a wonderful, wonderful talk. And so this brings us to the end of our talks. If I could ask our speakers to come back on camera because we would love to discuss a few of the questions that were uh, placed in the chat and it, you can all see the question. So I think there there are some very, very valued, valid questions. Um, you know, maybe the first question for um, Dr. Strange. So Chad, there's this question. Can you um, determine- Christina? Can yes. I just remind people maybe on Facebook uh, to please pose their questions there. So I'll hand them over to you later. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Um, so uh, Chad, can you determine following chemo radiation if a tumor is um, as a, you know, one of our audience members posted dead, meaning uh, non-viable tumor? Is that something that you do with PET or any other modality? 
or any other of the speakers? Marcy, I'm not sure I understand exactly. I know that, you know, we will follow those if they remain, you know, after therapy, um, they're, they're routinely followed with contrast enhanced CT. If they remain stable in size, they're often left alone. Obviously, if there's any question, you know, you can do repeat PET, repeat MRI, um, you know, if there's, if certainly if there's any increase in size, but if they stay stable in size, not necessarily. So, so PET, you wouldn't utilize PET to determine viability of tumor or, or not, or vice versa. I guess that that was the question. Okay. I don't want to misspeak. Are you talking about like after therapy? Yes. I, there was the question was, so I'm reading the question the, the the carcinoma has reduced by 50% post chemo radiation and one year it's later. And can you find out if it's, and they put dead. And so I assume it's viability. I mean, if it's one year after and stable in size, I don't think we would routinely do a PET CT at that point if a year out it's stable in size. I mean, certainly if there was a question of viability, PET would be great for that. But I don't think that we would routinely do it a year out if it were stable in size. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Um, maybe a question to all of our speakers. Can you, well, how do you follow up thymic cysts, thymic hyperplasia? Do you do that? Uh, and if so, how? I don't know, maybe Dr. Ackman, Jean, do you yeah, want to sure. chime in? So um, I helped uh, write the ACR guidelines for imaging of mediastinal masses. And we came to the conclusion that really the best way to surveil these lesions is by MRI. One, there's no ionizing radiation, but more importantly, you can more reliably tissue characterize. As we've seen with multiple examples, CT can be misleading. And by MR, you can be more assured of detecting even subtle areas of mural nodularity or enhancement that might push you toward calling malignancy as opposed to benignity. And in reverse, um, detecting uh, features of benignity. And so um, we, we monitor them by MR to reduce radiation exposure and have more diagnostic confidence in what we're dealing with. And, and also because the um, MR can inspire more confidence in terms of diagnosis, we can often spread out the surveillance um, interval uh, much greater than we can by CT. Instead of a three month follow-up, we might do six months or 12 months if we're fairly confident of benignity, but not absolutely certain. And Christina, if I could just offer, the Midwest experience is slightly different. I think that's one of the great things about the webinars. When we diagnose thymic hyperplasia or cysts, we do not do any follow-up. We, we, we consider it completed. Sorry yeah, I was... uh, if there's a misunderstanding. I, I agree with you, San Sanjeev. If, if we're convinced that something is benign, we don't advocate follow-up. It's only in those more probably benign but indeterminate cases that will do surveillance. There's no difference. I, I agree with you 100% with that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for you know coming to uh, an agreement because that's what we would, would do, what, what we would do here at OHSU as well. And it's always good if we we sort of agree because you know I think that we all do things slightly differently, but an agreement is a good thing. Um, which brings me to the the next point of discussion: When do we biopsy? When do we biopsy a thymic lesion, and what do we want to know for for that? That was a question from the the audience as well. Anybody want to chime in? Sanj, maybe Dr. Oh, yeah. I, I can, oh yeah, let you me go. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Costa. I mean, I think there's a couple reason, couple situations where you would biopsy an anterior mediastinal lesion, not just a thymic lesion. Uh, one is you think it might be something else. Uh, particularly lymphoma, because lymphoma is treated with chemotherapy and not surgery. So if you've got an anterior mediastinal mass that's extending around vessels or is associated with a lot of pleural or pericardial fluid, you should think about lymphoma. Uh, in some patients who have spread of disease that's obvious on, on imaging studies, you may want to biopsy the, the lesion percutaneously because you ultimately don't need to surgerize it. If it's extensively locally invasive or has soft solid organ mats particularly, there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how thymic lesions are treated, uh, particularly those with pleural spread. Uh, we see thymomas that have disease in the pleura that are, are resected, uh, and then they manage the, the pleural disease separately. Um, so th those are the two, the two big things, I think. If you think it's something else or could be something else, or if you want to get tissue of it uh, in lieu of the fact the patient has extensive disease elsewhere, I, I don't think it's indicated to be biopsying just a solid mass and the anterior mediastinum that you are pretty convinced is a thymoma. That, that's like surgery or nothing. Uh, 
I mean, it, there, there are people that follow some of those that, that are in older patients, but it's, it, to me, that's really surgery or nothing. I don't think it's worth a biopsy. And I will tell you that um, when I was looking through those cases, a, a fair number of them were biopsied and several of them had huge bleeds because you're, you're attacking that lesion through an area um, where there's vessels. You can hit the internal mammary vessels. Uh, so it's not it's not like the safest biopsy in the world. So I think we'd avoid it um, unless there was a real clinical reason to get it. Uh, make, makes total sense. I mean, I think that that's also something where we can all agree on. This is how we would do it as well. Um, so this is a question that is more particular to uh, sequences. Uh, Gene, any place for ADC maps in MRI for of the thymus? Um, yes, it, it's an extra tool in the in the toolbox when we have uh, lesions that uh, are indeterminate even by MRI uh, with the initial pulse sequences. So for us to this point, it's been an option that we pull out when we're um, dealing with a case of suspected thymic hyperplasia, but we're not seeing suppression on a post-phase imaging. Um, we also uh, might use it again if we're trying to help weigh benign versus malignant disease or, or um, distinguish low risk from high risk thym thymic epithelial tumors and, and lymphoma, but only as um, sort of a diagnostic weighing tool, not so much as an absolute um, indicator. It just, it's just something else. It's an adjunct that helps us make uh, clinical judgments. Uh, thank you. And and that maybe maybe we could also, you know, touch briefly on, you know, for all our speakers here, PET CT versus MRI in the setting of malignant thymic lesions. Um, I, I know that we have our guidelines and I know that we have our pathways how we like to do the imaging, but maybe we can quickly chat, chat about that. The, one of our attendants was asking uh, what's the best imaging modality for malignant thymic lesions. Um, Chad, I think a lot of it depends on your or... on, on the question that you're trying to answer. Um, I think that if you're looking for distance spread, I think PET's great. I think if you're looking for local extent of disease, I think MRI is, is excellent for that, particularly vasculature. Um, for characterizing potentially benign things, I think that MR is better um, because a lot of the things that could be benign won't be avid, but so will thymomas, may not be particularly avid, so you end up kind of caught um, on those. But it, it really is based on, on the specific question that you're trying to answer, and it's case by case. I think it'd be easy to say that, I mean, I, I guess I do a lot of MR, so I like MR, but, but PET definitely has a role, particularly in thymic carcinomas, for looking for distance spread of disease. Um, and that, that's predominantly how we use it here, or at least use it most effectively. I'm not sure if Chad has maybe a little bit different take on that or more expanded uh, use of PET. No, I mean, honestly, I agree with you. If you're trying to decide what it is and trying to make the diagnosis and look for local invasion, MRIs clearly superior for that. Once you've figured out this is a high grade something and you're looking for where is it gone? I mean, that that to me is the primary role for PET. So I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I and see I, Dr. Marum, sorry, sorry. I see that Dr. Marum has her hand uh, up. Yeah, with... excellent responses. Just wanted to add one more thing. So we clarify it. And that is that uh, thymomas can not uncommonly be not FDG avid. So just throwing in there, a follow-up with PET-CT means nothing when the tumor doesn't have any uptake. So as, as was mentioned before, the decision of if to do a PET-CT scan is really tailored to the patient and also takes into account the histology of the, of the tumor because many thymomas will not be FDG avid, so it'll be a waste of time and money. I agree with all that uh, everyone has said. I will only add that to assess extent of Plural drop metastases, MRI is an excellent means as we, you know, we've used it for years for mesothelioma. It's superb at identifying plural drop metastases. And as was mentioned, in cases in which you have indolent plural metastases, they may not light up on a PET, but they are quite visible on T2-weighted MRI imaging and on pre and post contrast dynamic imaging. Diffusion-weighted imaging can be helpful for detection as well. For, so again, for de uh, detecting pleural drop metastases, MR it can be quite useful. And PET, um, as many have mentioned, uh, and uh, Dr. Strange advocated, is super helpful as uh, assessing for extent of metastatic disease, especially in the setting 
of thymic carcinoma, metastatic to liver, lung, and bone. So um, just highlighting MR's value for pleural gout metastases here. I wanted to just add one thing that Chad had mentioned in his talk that is easy to overlook is the value of PET for localizing a site for biopsy. Yes. We've had a few cases here where we've had intermediastinal masses, which have been biopsied and read on initial biopsy as fibrosing mediastinitis, which we all know is atypical in the intermediastinum, only to have them turn out later to be fibrous thymomas or Hodgkin, uh, nodular sclerosing Hodgkin, which is notorious for having fibrosing areas when we targeted the hot areas, we could get the diagnosis. So I think that's a very good use for PET CT. Um, quick question about what else we do with our patients with thymic malignancies. There was a question from the audience. Do we scan the brain? Yes, no. Depends on the pathology. Silence. <laughs> Hand over to the neuroradiologist. That's what I would do. <laughs> Edith, please. So, um, you know that how we scan, there are, are different guidelines that get, make suggestions, and it is not a routine. Um, thymic carcino thymo thymomas and thymic carcinomas usually do not go to the brain, but rarely this can happen. So just like with any other uh, exam and follow-up, It'll probably depend on the clinical scenario and if there are any symptoms, but it is not routinely done. And it's not in any of the guidelines. Thank you. That uh, answers a very, a very important question. And then there was one more question, and I think then we'll, we, we will have to wrap it up. But you know, one question was, if you are assessing an anterior mediastinal lesion, um, should you always... Uh, include post-contrast images or can non-contrast images be sufficient? Um, if I may answer uh, for that, um, as you may have seen from some of the examples in my talk, there were a bunch of cases in which the T1 and T2 weighted imaging um, raised the possibility that a lesion could still be cystic. And it wasn't until we gave the contrast and, and sometimes did post-process subtracted imaging that we could be sure that there was no enhanced, no uh, solid cellular material. So I think it's very risky, especially upon baseline imaging, to not do pre and post contrast. If for some reason a patient can't get iodinated IV contrast or gadolinium, an MR without contrast is better than nothing. But it is a bit hazardous to not give that contrast and, and do a comprehensive evaluation, especially at baseline. And then even at follow up. If you're feeling, if you're getting a sense that there could be some complexity on your pre-contrast images, you may want to give contrast again because it'll increase your sensitivity for detecting those two or three millimeter mural nodules that could indicate that we're dealing with something other than a benign lesion. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think I, we, I, we, I think we covered the questions in the chat. You know, to to our audience, if there's you know, one last pressing question that we haven't, uh, that we haven't answered, then please post it. But if not, then uh, first and foremost, I, I would like to thank our speakers today, you know, for their excellent talks. Um, this was truly insightful. And I think I, I personally am going to take home a lot of uh, important information. And uh, I would like to thank the STR and ITMIC for hosting this uh, webinar. And I'm going to pass uh, the baton over to uh, Dr. Marom um, for maybe some closing comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Great talks, great questions and answers. And just please, please follow the uh, ITMIC website. We have more webinars uh, on this uh, Thymic Awareness uh, uh, Month. And uh, hope to see you next time on any of our ITMIG or STR webinars. Thank you for joining. Thank you Thank very you much, everybody. Have a lovely weekend. Thanks, you too. Bye.